you again to everyone who presented today with um, a collection of absolutely amazing talks that were all compressed into also an absolutely amazing 10 minutes each. Um, we were very impressed at um, the restraint and the discipline that everyone showed, but also the ability to communicate such widely varying topics. It was fantastic. And we look forward to yet more tomorrow um, with our program of a whole nother set of, of presenters. Um, so right now we're going to um, have our keynote um, by Professor Richard Rottenberg, who's um, come here from Germany to um, participate in this symposium, so we're very thankful. He's the Chair of Anthropology at the Institute for Anthropology and Philosophy at Martin Luther University, and um, he's a Max Planck Fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology, where he heads the Law, Organization, Science, and Technology Research Group. So he's written and edited books on the Sudan, economic anthropology, the transcultural production of objectivity, and theorizing post-neoliberal governance. He's the author of Far-Fetched Facts, A Parable of Development Aid, 2009 English translation, but as we learned yesterday, that this is almost a historical work, you know, through the process of writing it in the 90s, publication first in German and now uh, more recently in English. Um, so more recent work, uh, he's co-editor of Rethinking Biomedicine and Governance in Africa, Contributions from Anthropology, and also Identity Politics and the New Genetics, Recreating Categories of Difference and Belonging. Um, we're also, I think, very lucky to have already um, interacted with him yesterday in a master class where he also <coughs> was clear in, um, in offering and sharing his knowledge, not in the Catholic missionary sense of, <laughs> of sharing the obligation <laughs> to teach, but in really opening up and having a very um, stimulating conversation about um, ethnography and methods and development in science studies and on and on. So um, please help me in welcoming him to uh, his talk. Thank you very much for this uh, kind and flattering invitation. I, I found it so flattering that I rescheduled another trip. I was planned to be in northern Iraq. Uh, but then I, when I discovered that this is an invitation from a, a group of graduate students, I, I felt I can't uh, say no, and I changed my traveling plan to the Iraq, so thanks for having me here. Um, and apologies for not being fluent in English. I'm not bi it's not my mother tongue, and I'm not even bilingual. I understand and read English, uh, but what I'm not so good at, and I have to do it now, is to develop the thought while I speak. And uh, there is a famous uh, short story by Heinrich Kleist on the Verfertigung der Gedanken im Sprechen. And in, in my age I can't stand here and read a paper, so I, I'm giving a paper and developing thoughts while I talk in English is, is difficult. Uh, you will have to bear with me. And also I have chosen a topic which is rather abstract, so it will uh, not be easy accessible. And I'm the last one, so I'm in between the end of the day and I, uh, your end of the day. Uh, I might uh, start with a little joke on the University of Halle. Freya uh, just asked me now, what is it? Is it uh, Martin Luther University or is it the University of Halle? And uh, there was uh, a, a joke earlier, I uh, don't remember by whom. Oh, what a nice name, Martin Luther University. It's like calling a university Calvin University in the earth. <laughs> <laughs> the first comment is, it's just a normal university. And in Germany, we have normal universities. We don't have this ranking. We are inventing it now, following this uh, wonderful model here. <laughs> So it's a normal university. The name, however, is interesting. Uh, the name of this university, which is uh, 500 years old, uh, changed several times. It had the names of uh, emperors and so on, and eventually it was the University of Halle, uh, until uh, Heinrich Goebbels uh, came to Halle and tried to convince the Senate of the university to change the name of the university to uh, Adolf Hitler University. <laughs> 
and the then members of the Senate, which most of them were members of the NSDAP party, they still were smart enough to realize that this might not be the best idea. So they offered as a compromise to, we, of course, we definitely have to change the name, but what about Martin Luther University? So it's a remote uh, story, but this is how university names happen. And now, how <laughs> and now when you travel abroad and you come to the US, where some, uh, some names are like brands, and some can operate with acronyms, but if I say MLU, then everybody looks at me, what was MLU? <laughs> so, therefore, University of Halle. I, I try to see whether this works with my Macintosh. So, the, I'm speaking about today about authorizing knowledge, and when I speak about authorizing knowledge, uh, by implication, I also uh, need to speak about deauthorizing uh, knowledge. And I start from a general assumption, then I formulate my topic, and then I take it through a few arguments. No, it doesn't work. So. First of all, and this has been said, and it's obvious, but it needs to be repeated, knowledge is, is part of institutions, or institutions uh, uh, authorize knowledge, or they have a function, it's mainly a semantic function, they stabilize what we are supposed to believe in, and we sometimes believe it, and partly believe it, uh, or certain communities believe it, and others don't believe it, but uh, usually the knowledge uh, which we share and we think it is the right knowledge is the kind of knowledge which we cannot prove ourselves. So the, the reason why we trust the knowledge is that institutions uh, stand, beh uh, stand behind it. And before we had this joke, when the light went off, uh, our colleague uh, uh, said, uh, oh, this is African magic, and she started the light again. <laughs> So it's not African magic. We trust the institution who is in installing this technology, and we don't know how it works, but we know that they, they know what they do. They might not know what they do in, on a larger scale, but I'm coming to that. So there is this, this link between knowledge and institutions when it comes to confirming knowledge. When it comes to uh, challenging knowledge is the same, but, but first there is another dimension. It's not just institution, it is uh, knowledge as part of reasoning, of testing, and of reflexive considerations. So w we are not victims to believe whatever our institutions want us to believe, but we have the chance to reason about it, to test it, to ask others to test it, and to be re reflexive about it. And uh, usually this is uh, classified as the realm of uh, scientific confirmation. So we have political forms and scientific forms of confirming knowledge which sometimes compete and uh, sometimes contradict each other. But they are not exactly the same, although they are uh, unavoidably uh, woven together. Now the same can be said about deauthorizing knowledge. So there are political forms of critique or of deauthorizing knowledge which do not necessarily come from the, the field of scientific knowledge production, but they come from the political field itself. They might have ethical reasons, they might have economic reasons, or they might have pure power reasons, but there, there are forms of political critique which again are different from form, forms of critique which are related to reasoning, testing, and uh, which uh, usually are classified as scientific uh, critique. Now, authorizing and deauthorizing is a, a dynamic. We never have a situation where we have the one or the other. And the political uh, and the scientific dimension of it, again, are not uh, two opposing ends, but they are creating uh, and uh, stabilizing and destabilizing each other. And I'm in, in my talk I will try to relate to the topic of the conference. Is there something like a new development and what does it mean to provincialize expertise? And this is the, the most abstract way of framing the question, in a, I guess, in a sociological way. Now, in order to 
make my argument accessible, I, I draw a distinction between various forms of critique. Now, uh, I start with what I call pre-critical studies. Now, this is not meant to be taken literally that anybody does a study and is, is not critical, but you will, will see wh what I mean in a moment. So, so-called pre-critical studies are based on better empirical evidence. What, what, they, what a pre-critical study tries to achieve is better empirical evidence. Another form of putting it is uh, formulating in, in Kuhn's terminology is no, normal science. Or, and, often both at the same time, it's based on a, tri or it tries to base itself on a superior methodology. It ascribes itself the capacity to discover regularities in the world. And uh, I'm uh, refraining myself to the, the social world. And the capacity to predict and design politics. There, there is a, a certain uh, atmosphere which whenever uh, one enumerates these four points, it sounds like that was yesterday, that was in the 50s, that's gone, we are doing something else. Uh, yes, to some degree we are doing something else, but uh, maybe not always. Who is not trying to produce better empirical evidence? Who is not trying to improve the methodology? And what would the purpose be of this whole conference on development if it was not about identifi identifying regularities and, and perhaps uh, by describing them having uh, or, or creating a situation where a better world can be uh, done through better politics. So all, all, all the, the talks were had this level. But it's not the level on which we uh, like uh, to stay. We are somewhere else. Uh, however, there was a time when, when this was self-evident and I came a few days earlier, so I walked through San Francisco and I visited this little tower, the, the Coil Tower, which is full with these fantastic murals, which I didn't know of. And it was amazing to see, for instance, this picture in San Francisco, which is from the 30s. And the amazing thing for me was that you could have the same picture in Moscow, in Berlin, in Paris, in London, and obviously in San Francisco in those days. And in a sense, this is the, the artistic visualization of, I, of what I said before. This, this picture visualizes the trust in identifying regularities in the world, inspiring a, a, politi a policy towards a better world and constructing this uh, better world. Uh, but that was in the 30s and uh, it's not our time. In, in the meantime, we had what has become known, and, and this is now not a, a label which I invented for the sake of my argument, it's a circulating label, we have critical studies. Now, critical studies primarily focus on superior, on, on, on the attempt to produce a superior uh, theory with the emphasis on a reflexive theory. So critical studies don't uh, present themselves as producing better evidence, but producing better theory. And they start from the premise that there is no view from nowhere. In other words, they, from the very beginning, challenge the possibility to have the, the final word in, in anything. And they claim to have the capacity to grasp epistemological presuppositions of any world descriptions, including of the critical study itself. And hence, it is a business of deconstruction, of, of deconstructing constellations of uh, power, knowledge, and uh, subjectivity. Uh, we experience, or this is w what uh, now I cannot uh, take for granted, the, the previous slide I can take for granted, but now I have the impression that we are going through a time when a certain dissatisfaction with critical studies has arisen, and 
it's have, uh, when somebody says I'm doing critical medical anthropology or I'm doing this critical or that critical, you, you start wondering, well, so indifference to what? And, uh, and this relates to a certain frustration about the business of uh, deconstruction. We, we have, for about 30 years, uh, publications which are all about the making of this or the making of, of that. And when you, when you summarize all this, this valuable work of which I'm part of, and I don't want to sort of debunk it, but when you, when you summarize it, it is work which shows how things should not be done. While the, 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 the text which produces this evidence uh, rarely but sometimes does give you an insight how then this criticism is being done. That's something which I tried to achieve with my book Farfetched Facts, which I'm not sure whether I did, but it was an attempt. Namely, I was writing the making of development and at the same time I wrote the text in such a way that you can follow how the, the text is being made. But now to this frustration about debunking and deconstructing. How can we go beyond debunking and deconstructing seems to be a, a burning uh, question. And uh, I guess it's a question which is implied in the, in the topic of this uh, conference. Do we have something a new, uh, like a new development? And uh, the hope <coughs> that by provincializing expertise we don't just debunk something but we maybe see something new is I think a, a way to, to reflect about how to go beyond deconstruction debunking. Uh, a dimension of this is the impossibility of fact value dichotomy which was it's, it's known since a while you can trace this back to a number of names uh, since I'm the US and I know how uh, US science works from outside, you, you are specialists in dropping the right name now. <laughs> <laughs> like before somebody said, what was it? It was somebody referred to, to Steve with something which is obvious, everybody knows it, but Steve may be first formulated. Okay, I forgot the point, maybe it comes later. Now here maybe, can I guess, you would say Hillary Putnam? No? Whom would you, whom would you? Since when do we, which, who is the uh, woman or the man, usually American, who first <laughs> opened our eyes that this dichotomy between fact and value does not work. I don't know. For, for me, if it's an American name, it's Hilary Putnam in philosophy. <laughs> if it's in the social sciences, it's Max Weber, if I'm allowed. <laughs> <laughs> With his essay on the objectivity of the social sciences. Uh, but we all got used to, to this in fact, so th it's not a point to whom we attribute this discovery. W few of us believe that you either have uh, a statement of fact or you have a statement of value. And of course, uh, uh, Bruno Latour also had some remarks on this, uh, but he anyway is famous for not quoting the guys from whom he has it, so... <laughs> We don't need to <laughs> quote him here. <laughs> so, so that's one presupposition for moving towards post-critical studies. Namely, that anyway, we, if we cannot distinguish fact and value, uh, then we can, or we have to unveil what the criticism comes from. And uh, in other words, we have to make a, a, a positive future. And, uh, and, and explain from which uh, point of view the criticism is being formulated. Is, is, am I okay with the microphone or is it too loud? And if it's then not loud enough, you, you, you wave the finger. Uh, in analogy to the uh, fact-value dichotomy, which is that, also the dichotomy between 
a neutral statement or a political statement is, is uh, dead. It, it doesn't work any longer. It's just another formulation of the, of the same thing. So if that is so, then w what capacity is left? Uh, there is the, the, we don't have any longer the capacity to, speak, to simply speak truth to power or have on the one hand power and on the other hand neutral uh, value-free signs. So w what is left is a capacity to speak practically. And I think this re relates to the expertise, to the practices of expertise which Ewa Jung was uh, uh, managing, uh, mentioning before. Uh, you have, or we have a shift towards the pragmatic and towards experimental engagement with concrete situations. It's a shift away from making large theoretical explanations, engaging with situations, being pragmatic and being cautious or being experimental. And uh, the uh, assemblages which were explained to us before is, can also be, s be described as a form of tinkering or as a form of r recombining given things in an experimental way. The, the, the bill one has to pay for this is that there is no chance any longer to hide behind theories and methodologies when making a, a statement as a, as a scholar, as a social scientist. You can't say, these are my results, I worked according to methodology, to uh, the golden standard of methodology and this is my theory and don't criticize me and I'm not responsible, this is the truth. Uh, statements of truth ha uh, have to come along with taking up responsibility, which is yet another way of formulating the death of the fact-value dichotomy. So, if you follow me in this argumentation, uh, and, and of course it's a caricature, but it's to clarify an argument that w we have these three dimensions in when we do social science research. We have pre-critical pre dimensions, we just want better evidence, we, we want to have the better argument. We have the critical dimension, we, we want to be self-reflexive on what we are doing and we at the same time or some of us feel the urge to be post-critical in, in being pragmatic and being helpful in a specific situation. And then the question is, what is the methodology of this uh, critique? And I would say that the, the, f the first point is, accept that all, that all the instrumental uncertainties which uh, the critical and post-critical studies have uh, uh, worked out are there. We, we cannot go back to pre-critical studies. But still, although we don't have the chance to go back to pre-critical studies and believe that we can have a neutral, value-free, non-political, scientific representation of reality, but we still want to do things. Namely, we still want to discover regularities, we still want to grasp the epistemological epistemological presuppositions of what we are doing and uh, we still want to enhance the capacity to improve our reflexive theory. This is what we are doing all the time since this morning. And we still in a more twisted way want to speak truth to power even if we cannot just refer to the facts. Now there is a certain aporia here how to circumvent this aporia, because how can you do uh, believe in the one and then still do the other one? And I think it's helpful to uh, be reminded here of the gene genealogy of how to deal with this aporia. So the aporia is that we have no formula to anchor social analysis. The, the, the picture which I've shown from the mural from San Francisco, from the 30s, was not touched by these doubts. It was rather the opposite. We have science and technology, we are building a, a, a better world, we have the modernist formula. This formula has been lost. 
Now the uh, awareness of this condition, namely having lost this formula, is, is not new. And I think it's important, it may be redundant, but it's important to remind ourselves that this is really not new. And uh, every now and again somebody writes an article or gives a talk as if something completely <coughs> shocking new has been found about the loss of this formula. <laughs> So the formula has been lost in the catastrophes of the 20th century. It was Stalinism, it was German Nazism, and it were other projects of the 20th century which all are now the darkest chapters in human history and they were all built on the belief in the formula on how to construct a better world on the basis of a true theory. So the formula was lost in the 20th century. In theory, the formula was lost much earlier. And again, we can have this game, when was it lost in theory? <laughs> I like to uh, remind of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche in, in a paper which was in a few page papers. Über Lüge und Wahrheit im außermoralischen Sinn on lies and truths in a non-moral sense which was written in 1873. That is a key text which becomes the starting point, for instance, for Foucault. Now, the funny thing is that this formula is being rediscovered, as I said at the beginning, ever again and again and again. Somebody comes up and says, we have a problem here. Now, we have this <laughs> problem all along. And although we have a problem here, there is this deep dissatisfaction, this profound frustration about being deconstructive and being critical while the world is falling apart. And uh, my gut feeling is that since the financial crisis, the fr frustration about this deconstructive mode has increased be because we can, we can see what global capital, financial capitalism does and we are busy deconstructing how financial markets are being constructed. That's fine. But then how to avoid the disaster is a burning issue which does not necessarily have, have to be answered by any scholar, but talking towards this issue is another thing than debunking the production of expertise knowledge. So in this debate, I think one can identify something like, or what I wish to suggest here today, to, uh, to, uh, to call them, uh, to call it post-critical vocabularies. New vocabularies emerge which are only understandable as a reaction uh, to the frustration with critical studies. Talking about materiality, about things, about das Ding in the Heideggerian sense, makes sense in this context because it is the materiality which brings its own logic into it which makes it impossible to to define laws because the thing has its own internal uh, logic and we need to do justice to it another uh, word which is uh, gaining in circulation is affect now affect is just the the piece which was moved out of uh, the formula of uh, uh, producing a model, modern world through rationalization. Now here we have affect again. So, or on another, other level as Luc Boltanski had his book a few years ago about love and justice, which in another word is about compassion, about the human capacity to know that somebody is suffering and to know what it means to suffer. It's an increasing circulation of the word care, or the, the practice of care, which again has a Heideggerian root of Sorge, which is the, the main modus of existence, of Dasein. And uh, affect, love, care, they are all related to hope. And we have, with hope, we have uh, Hiro Miyakazi's methodology of hope, and with good faith we have uh, Helen Veran's uh, good faith. So I, I think these vocabularies 
are they come in a package so to speak and it's time to re reflect why we are uh, using these uh, words and I like to add uh, another one and then uh, come to my observation to it I think uh, when we when we have with Helen Veran good face or with Boltanski love and justice then we also have critique as an in inherent aspect of social ordering and there were several uh, uh, remarks during this day and also yesterday uh, during the master class w which I w which I could choose as nice examples on how critique is always inherent in social ordering and uh, now I, I try to develop this argument and I will I will present three approaches and in doing so I I use this occasion to, to think about what I was I doing and what am I doing and what do I hope to do in the in the future and part of what I was doing and am still doing is related to compassion and the suffering of others and uh, this is my ethnography of uh, uh, South Sudan in the Nuba mountains which probably nobody knows about it. It was uh, my PhD thesis in the early 90s which was published in German and never translated and therefore never read. <laughs> I actually discovered on Freya's computer the reason why it was never read because Freya on her computer has the this uh, sign which was oh. all over Berlin that your, your attention you are leaving the American sector. <laughs> And the sequence of languages was actually as it is on her computer. Where is it? It's uh, English, Russian, French in big letters. Yes. <laughs> German is last. And in then in very small letters in German. <laughs> <laughs> now imagine this in post-war Berlin. <laughs> Nobody spoke any of these languages. <laughs> You are just about to run into a machine gun fire <laughs> and you are told in English and in Russian. <laughs> so this happened to my book of 91. <laughs> but this work continues and I will, uh, I'm compromising in the meantime, I will write it in English. <laughs> the second one is about a dimension of my now English accessible book Farfetch facts a responsibility for the exploitation of others so the making of development and the creation of standards of objectivity on how to assess poverty and how to define instruments on how to deal with it is can be formulated as a question of responsibility to stay in this post-critical vocabulary so compassion responsibility and uh, the, the third one would be fundamental uncertainty so living with the situation that the formula has been lost the uncertainty is fundamental but, but still we are dealing with compassion and we are dealing with responsibility and now I will go through this uh, three dimensions this is uh, my friend Jemson in the South Sudan Jemson was born in 1943 or approximately this picture which you have seen was taken in March 2010 Jemson was living under conditions of war most of his life namely when he was an adolescent boy in 56 the first war broke out which lasted until 72 the, the next war broke out in 85 which lasted until 2002 and 2011 the, the last war broke out and it continues to make his life miserable the technological link between me and Jemson since I can't go there any longer since 2010 is I make airtime transferals. I transfer money to Khartoum, then people buy airtime and they transfer the airtime to him and then he goes to a merchant who gives him grain. So mm, Jemson is one of my best friends and he is the one who makes me work on my second volume on, on South Kordofan which will be on the technological integration of a war zone 
So the theoretical question relevant to, to the issue of, of critique, responsibility, and compassion is what forms of authorization of knowledge on a war zone are there? Who is authorized to tell a story on how Jemson is? And analyzing the institutional infrastructure, so to speak, in, in, a, in a global dimension is necessary to uh, uh, dig this out. For me, as, as an ethnographer, since I can only speak as an ethnographer, as a scientist, and I cannot s switch codes to become a member of, for instance, the Carter Center, which observed the, the latest elections in Southern Kordofan and confirmed them as proper elections, I can only write a counter-narrative. So I'm back to critiquing, but I don't have the possibility to refer to absolute truths, to methodology, to a theory, I have to speak concretely. I have to tell the, the story of Jemson, of his family, and of the technological links between him and myself and others. I have to insist properly. This is w w what is left. So, in other words, I have a book project, uh, which is picking up old stuff and rewriting it in, in reference to this post-critical issue of uh, compassion. I have a finished book years ago, The Far-Fetched Facts, which uh, in this context I like to present under responsibility. It's the responsibility which everybody has because we live in, in one world. There are ethical and juridical claims to universal equality, which was mentioned today. We, we have different situations, but if somebody has a cancer uh, in outside of Kampala, the question of how this person gets to Mulago Hospital and what kind of roasting takes place there is an, a deep offense against our understanding of uh, equality. So it's an intolerable uh, situation. Uh, in order to produce this uh, equality, it's, a, it's all about infrastructures providing access. And all these projects can be summarized as projects constructing infrastructures in order to create a situation that uh, ethical and juridical claims to universal equality uh, can be achieved. This infrastructure implies agreeing on standards and measures which are the same, or at least make a translation from context to context uh, possible. So it's about establishing forms and conventions by which to deal with infrastructures that are there to uh, create equality. And uh, the hardest language in these forms and convention is about numeric uh, evidence. And I'm presently working together with others uh, among others with uh, Sally Mary on a volume on the production of uh, n n numeric evidence. In my book, to which I refer here, where I studied these issues, and I was not explicit on my post-representational, my, my post-critical uh, approach, it sort of occurred to me later that this is a post-critical approach, I was mainly focusing on the observation that everybody working in this field can speak in two codes, can speak in a code which follows the forms and the conventions and the numeric evidence with which you can, uh, can make an argument. And the last session was, the, the last session was dealing with this, with, with staging and, and presenting. So it's sometimes it is staging and presenting, but, but sometimes it's negotiating. But a negotiation can only uh, take place uh, among people who agreed on certain standards. Others, otherwise, you cannot possibly have a negotiation and you have a, a misunderstanding. You have to uh, start again and first agree on, on these standards. So ev everybody in the in the world of constructing infrastructures in so-called development contexts knows to speak in a meta-code. 
and at the same time can switch to another code and be critically aware that of what I was now debating in the meta code. In fact, it's not exactly what I know, what I believe, what I think sh should be done, but it's the only thing that can be done at the moment. And uh, as I said, I, I came a few days earlier, so I was also reading the newspaper. And in the San Francisco Chronicle a few days ago, I read uh, an article. And this referred to uh, the California Medical Association. I allow you to read the, the quote from the website of the association. So you are aware of, of the, the issue, the Proposition 8 in, in, in California, and uh, maybe you are aware of what the California Medical Association and the American Medi Medical Association did. So what they did, they were filing an amicus brief, which is, although not invited to, if you feel as an organization or even as an individual uh, responsible, you can uh, deliver information to the S Supreme Court which may use the information or may not use the information. So what the American Medical Association has done here, they have taken up responsibility and uh, delivered or they filed this amicus brief to the Supreme Court. Uh, at the same time, currently in most African states, homosexuality is classified as a criminal offense. I, I lost my, my own data, so I, I, had the, I counted them and so on, but it's nearly all of them. Since 2010, uh, for whatever contingent reasons, uh, in Uganda this has become a burning issue. The Ugandan parliament every, every now and again works on an amendment which, which has been submitted by a, a certain group of people, or, uh, amendment of the relevant legislation with the intent to step up the punishment, primarily in relation to HIV-related cases. So it's, a, it's an enormous aggravation uh, because even health staff can uh, end up uh, being accused of supporting uh, H, uh, homosexuals when the homosexual come with uh, an HIV infection. Uh, Obama just made one remark on, on this amendment that it's obvious. At the same time, the, the chief of parliament was in, in Canada and uh, there she was also asked wh what does this mean and the defense was interesting. The defense was the critique of the amendment comes from a Eurocentric or America-centric point of view. This is cultural. It is none of your business to interfere. Now, I'm presenting this argument here under respons compassion and responsibility. Now, how is this related to this uh, California medical uh, policy statement which I mentioned before? And what does it mean to have local knowledge? It is related in the following sense. The, uh, the, the amendment bill, which hasn't been uh, issued by the, uh, has not been passed by the Ugandan parliament, has been drafted by a guy who mainly receives support by uh, Christian NGOs from North America. So the inspiration that homosexuality is against humanity and has to be written down uh, and, 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 and the, 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 the legal uh, arrangement for this has, has to be uh, pushed up is supported by NGOs from North America. The LGBT movement, which fights against it, is also supported by NGOs, mostly from California. So what you have in Uganda when you debate the, the rights of homosexuals, is this now related is this now local? Is this just a, a field where North American and European problems are being dealt with? I think it is neither. It is normal. 
any issue we have nowadays, any burning issue, is not negotiated in one place. It is negotiated in several places at the same time and the people are as good connected as we are. It's not just we who have this meeting. The NGOs dealing with uh, LGBT issues are also well connected. They exchange the same ideas and, and, and so on. So, uh, therefore, I think this post-critical approach to think of responsibility makes sense. Sorry. Uh, now, as a, as a final uh, explanation for what I did with Farfetch Facts, which is not in the book, but it, it occurred to me later uh, uh, because of some is, uh, misunderstandings of reviews, the idea that you have a metacode, namely a language on which people who perceive themselves as living in the same world agree as the correct language is an old idea. And again, it is from the same text by Nietzsche from 1833, and I allow you to, to read the quotation. So that w when he speaks about the peace treaty, he refers to the war of all against all and the way how to get out of the war of all against all is by agreeing on a language and then distinguishing between somebody who speaks right or somebody who speaks wrong. The important argument for, for me is this one, a uniformly valid and binding designation, what I call a metacode in my book, is invented for things and this legislation of language likewise establishes the first laws of truth. Now, for Nietzsche this is a fundamental principle of, of, of truth. For me, here a sociology starts from where you can analyze how these uniformly valid and binding designations are being constructed and uh, the global development arena is about constructing these binding designations and deconstructing them and reconstructing them but there is no way of avoiding it. So my, my last, uh, and I'm getting late but I will finish, my last uh, uh, part of it is about the fundamental un uncertainty. So if post-critical science deals with fundamental uncertainty and is unable to work out laws or at least r uh, regularities which make a prediction possible of how a society would look like before, then the, the new constellation of science and politics is what I call experimentalization. And this, at the same time, is a neoliberal argument. If everybody is being held accountable whether what you do is effective and you are being paid to what you achieve, then why should development politics not be uh, uh, measured by the same standard? And the reaction to this is the experimentalization. And, and this is a, a picture, a screenshot actually, as you can see, from a presentation by Esther Duo, who is uh, giving an example on how to, how to do an eff effective intervention by doing a randomized trial. So there are uh, three different uh, camps, uh, places where people live, and uh, you have uh, children to immunize and then you, you can compare. In the one camp you do nothing, in the other camp you give a certain incentive and then you can compare and here by running this experiment, this is her argument, you now have proven that this is effective. So the, what from Nietzsche through Foucault to us here has emerged as living with fundamental uncertainty has already sneaked into policy by turning policy into an experimental policy. So critiquing policy as if it was still the old policy which is based on, 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 on eternal truths uh, doesn't work because they are already where, where we are. 
So we are dealing with uncertainty. The, and uh, to remind you, the modernist formula is being lost. We have an institutionalized skepticism, which is institutionalized already in the making of development. We have a shift from engineering to experimenting or uh, ramshackling or tinkering, as, as you wish. And so the, the, the key figure is experimentalization or, or testing. And uh, that always implies that, yes, we know, we will not, never know how the world works, but we do little steps and we are testing it. So I, I guess there here a new alliance between governance and technoscience are emerging. And the, and the question is whether a new development is visible uh, here. And uh, I believe on the ground we can ob observe that interventions are more and more run as controlled experiments and uh, sometimes they are reinterpreted as uh, controlled experiments but more and more are designed as controlled experiments. And in this realm, numeric evidence and uh, the idiom of probability are, are gaining more and more importance. So, there are various ways of uh, interventions run as uh, experiments. For instance, if you know the symptoms but you don't know the cause, like uh, cancer, or you know the end but you don't know the means, like poverty elevation or, or peace, or uh, worst, you, you suspect there is a problem, but you, you, you don't know its definition, you don't know its causes, you don't know its it, it, it effects and, uh, and therefore also no, not its remedies, like climate change. In, in all of these uh, different cases, experimentality is being offered as a solution. So where can then we stand as observers of, of second order of uh, the link between uh, technoscience and uh, development? We have to remain critical without escaping responsibility, I guess. And uh, this is possible. Why is it, po or when is it possible? It's possible if we realize that institutions, they establish and confirm commonality between heterogeneous things, and at the same time they articulate uh, dissenting views. So that institutions, if you, if you follow with me and I follow Luc Boltanski in this, are not about confirmation, they are also about critique. Why? Be because if an institution is a, is a set of rules which are meant to command action, there is always a space of uh, maneuvering, of critiquing. So in, in fact, confirmation presupposes critique. If there was no critique, you couldn't speak of confirmation and the other way around. You couldn't speak of critique if there was no con confirmation. So looking at how the institutions in which development is being produced are dealing with the dialectics of confirmation and critique. And, the, and the last, in the last sessions when we had this uh, distinction between the sex workers and the uh, the guys with the one computer, it, 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 it appeared that the one are, are just uh, uh, making a, a show, a presentation, while in fact it's about something else, while the, the sex workers are appropriating it and, and uh, critically uh, acting with, with the tools that have been given. Now, when we, we, f we follow this definition of the dialectic be between confirmation and critique, then we have reason to suspect that the critique in, in the case of the one laptop per child probably t takes place somewhere else. And the, the confirmation in the, in the case of sex workers also takes place some, something else. So it's, it remains a question of the unit of study. Uh, so maybe it was just a coincidence that they have selected this unit. If they would have taken the whole chain, or a, a longer chain, then they would have found elements of critique and elements of confirmation. So, uh, in other words, the methodology of critique for a post-critical SNTS and anthropology is 
to, to, to be aware that confirmation and critique are uh, uh, irresolvably connected to each other. And I think it's no coincidence that SNTS and anthropology are are, so to speak, the two candidates which have to deal with this problem. Because when, when you are an SNTS scholar, you cannot enter a lab or an engineering um, a, a place and, and tell the guy that uh, she's not aware of what she's doing because the second order observation observer knows better. It just doesn't work. And, and therefore, the attention to the limits of critique or the dialectic of critique and confirmation are sharpened through this simple fact and it's exactly the same in anthropology. Since about uh, 40 or 30 years uh, it has be become uh, uh, one of the most severe mistakes you can make as an anthropologist when you you, you come to a place and uh, people follow a, a, a certain uh, way of doing things there and, and <laughs> you say, oh, this, this is crap, you can't do it this way. <laughs> so it, it's, logically it has exactly the same point like with an SDS scholar coming to a lab. And, and, and therefore I think uh, the joining SNTS and anthropology in getting to a post-critical methodology of critique is important. So, if I summarize the argument, modern anthropology, in the sense of the anthropology of the early 20th century, had its attention on convictions and institutions as confirmations of which other people perform. This is how they are doing it, and so we are looking at their confirmations. The critical anthropology, which uh, some relate to the uh, writing culture debate, but of course there is a longer tradition. However, the critical anthropology has its focus on critique of representation of other worlds. So instead of describing the institutional patterns and the customs of other people, critical anthropology in fact is obsessed with analyzing how Euro-American cultural representations uh, uh, represent the other. And uh, critical or, or post-Mertonian science and technology studies, uh, studies, they focus on the critique of representations of nature. Now, the methodology of critique which I am offering here along with uh, the, the French school of pragmatic sociology is uh, to focus on a dialectic of confirmation and critique. Uh, and that brings me to my last sentences now. How to provincialize expertise when it resorts to experimentalization. When the experts working, they are already aware of w w what I'm saying here, and this is why they are just doing little experiments. Then here comes the anthropologists, and then on top of it wants to provincialize this expertise. And then it's hard to see how to do it. It's hard to see because how to how can you, pro how can we, I, I must say we, provincialize expertise when the issues we are dealing with are not provincial? And this is my example with the uh, American Medical Association and its statement about uh, homosexual marriage in California and the uh, amendment bill in Uganda. This doesn't require uh, local knowledge. It, it's, it doesn't require the provincialization of expertise. It requires a new form of expertise and, and I, I, I so, to, so to speak want to invite you to be courageous and develop this expertise. Mm -hmm. Namely by looking for the dialectics of confirmation and critique within the expertise. So these guys we are dealing with in the de 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 developmental world, they are aware of the limits of what they are doing and they are critical. And instead of focusing on their non-critical confirmational practices, one can uh, concentrate on their critical practices and then uh, together find uh, ways out. And, and, and where I want to encourage you and us is to even if it just sounds like a trick by now calling it differently metacritic, <laughs> <laughs> we still can formulate our own critique because we are visiting several of these places while an expert is the one who is an expert on one field and the second order observation can move from field to field 
and try to formulate a meta critique by still being aware that the formula has been lost. Uh, sorry for having uh, overdrawn my time with uh, at least 13 minutes, as I can see from my Mac computer. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and uh, your attention. Thank you. So we actually have a, uh, still uh, a lot of time for 